Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Zachary Moss with us today. Hey, Zachary. Uh, hello. Happy to be here. On this wonderful August 19th of 2022, as we shoot this. Uh, and that is a pretty awesome preserved dark sky poster over your right shoulder, I think that is. Yeah, I, uh, when I was a postdoc at UT Austin, I was able to go out to the McDonald Observatory. Oh, very cool. And I had to take something away from the gift shop on top of hearing some of the efforts to preserve dark skies over in uh, the Big Bend region of Texas. Right. So uh, it was great to get the poster and great to be there. Yeah, that's, that's totally awesome. How many times did you observe at uh, McDonald's? McDonald's uh, McDonald's. <laughs> It, I used a couple of the telescopes. So in 2020 and 2021, I had a couple of proposals on the 2.7 meter that were remote. And so I got to observe, you know, pajamas in my apartment. Uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> had a couple of Q observing runs on the big HET, but I was uh, excited in March of this year, I was able to actually drive out there and Very see nice. some person. Very nice. Very cool. Awesome. And that was then. Where are you at now, Zach? I am now just starting as a visiting assistant professor at Indiana University. Oh, so. very nice. Okay. Okay. So the, uh, let's say it's August in Indiana, so the corn is high and the humidity is high. And yes. Yeah, I feel, I'm from the Midwest originally. I'm from yeah. Minnesota and you can kind of hear okay. it. So okay. uh, it's like a coming back home. <laughs> there you go. Very cool. Very nice. Uh, well, it is definitely the uh, the wet season in Phoenix in August. This is when we get our rains. This is when the desert gets its moisture. Um, and yeah, we are in full, full summer bloom. So it's very good. Uh, and Zach, what do you like to do for research? I So I like to figure out what stars are made out of. Um, so I love um, taking stellar compositions that I've measured um, using models and observations from telescopes and learning either about the history of the Milky Way through galactic archaeology, I'm interested in how those abundances in a star can connect to host planets. And um, mm. I like thinking of nuclear fusion and nucleosynthesis. So since stars make everything, we can figure out what the stars are made out of and try to trace that back. Yeah, cool. so. Very cool. And that is gonna bring us to this very awesome AJ article. It's open access people. You can go get a copy for free, go grab a copy. The Galactic Distribution of Phosphorus, survey of 163 disk and halo stars. And Zach, take us away. Yeah, so this is combining um, sort of my three loves of stellar abundance work that I was mentioning before, uh, measuring phosphorus abundances in uh, many stars, at least for this element, uh, working with a lot of great people. So uh, Professor Keith Hawkins at UT Austin and Natalie Hinkle, uh, who created the Hypatia catalog and helped a lot with the uh, molar abundance work. Uh -huh. Cargyle, who helped with um, uh, getting the stellar abundances, which I can talk about later in the atmosphere parameters. Stephen Janowicki, who works at HET and is amazing in getting the observations. And Tyler Nelson, who's a graduate student at UT right. Austin, to help with the data reduction and doing a lot of cool stuff. Nice. And so it was a, a great team. Yeah. Um, and our big goal, as the title says, is to understand the galactic distribution of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And so um, phosphorus is an odd Z element. It's one of these oddball elements that we think can be made in a bunch of different ways, um, mm -hmm. which I'll talk about a little bit there in the introduction. Yeah. Uh, it might be made in core collapse supernova, it might be made in type 1A, so the exploding white dwarfs. It, it could be made through the S process, but maybe a different S process than we know um, that happens in AGB stars. Uh, but we don't really have the observations of this element to figure it out. Um, so unlike a lot of the other elements, iron and calcium and everything we're familiar with, uh, that has a lot of different absorption lines in the optical or infrared, phosphorus really has no good absorption features. Mm. Um, you can only find a couple of very weak lines either in the infrared Y-band, which is like okay. 1.05 microns, which is kind of a really difficult region to find um, with a, that an observatory can look at. Um, there are some lines in the H-band, and then okay. there are some lines in the far UV. And so okay. um, there's a bunch of different surveys in the past decade, starting with Cathodal 2011, um, using these wideband lines that have started getting at the chemical evolution of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. uh, and in total, all of these sort of individual surveys come to about 190 abundances with only about 20 per study. Um, which compared to something like you think of Galar or Apogee or these large surveys that are getting yeah. hundreds of thousands of abundances, it's almost nothing. 
Um, yet, on top of having this really interesting nucleosynthesis, phosphorus is also critical for life. It's in our DNA. Yep. Um, and so it's sort of this two big goals. We should probably know it from a important from life standpoint. We should probably know it because it's uh, just a particularly interesting element with mm -hmm. um, multiple different nucleosynthesis channels. Cool. Um, I should note that those H band lines are in the Apogee band pass, but they're really weak in Apogee. You generally need higher resolution. So the team does its best and they have a lot of amazing results, uh, but it's one of the most uncertain elements in the Apogee catalog. Um, nonetheless, it still led to some results like looking for phosphorus rich stars in which the lines would be whoppingly strong. And so those are some of the Masseron et al papers that uh, discover these really weird stars that point to phosphorus being made in the S process. Okay, so on the on the 163 stars, so you're basically doubling the known survey sample size. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Just make sure I got that number right. So we're we're doubling the the survey. Yeah. So it's I think it's the largest like homogeneous um, mm. phosphorus abundance mm. um, survey to date. Cool. With good precise uh, abundances. So that was the goal. Instead of going for the weird stuff, let's just try to get as many disk stars with some halo stars as we can. Right. Um, with HPF. Nice. Uh, to test some of these different nucleosynthesis um, theories. Mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. we can scroll down now. Okay. Get a sip of coffee. There you go. Looks good. Looks like we got a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a. Observations here? Yeah, it's a thicker one. Um, so these are three of the more metal poor stars in, uh, in our sample. Uh, so. The H or so the Y band lines, as I mentioned, those at 1.05 microns are very weak lines. Mm -hmm. And so we have three stars that are roughly the same temperature and surface gravity of the sun, but they're at different metallicities. So mm -hmm. the FE over H scale equals minus one is a tenth the metals of the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and so logarithm logarithmically, you will have lower and lower metals in the atmosphere. And so we can see that it's only a couple percent uh, of the continuum, the phosphorus one line. Um, for its depth. And so we need high signal to noise measurements. We can't go to really metal poor stuff. Otherwise, we just sort of lose the line entirely. Too weak, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and so we collected a large target list um, from, uh, from a couple different sources in the literature and got observations. And we focused on trying to get very high signal to noise, which limited us to about, you know, on the order of hundreds of stars mm -hmm. as opposed to these large surveys. So um, what, what was that signal to noise ratio? Uh, most of the stars, I think, have a signal-to-noise ratio of about 150, but some can be a little higher or lower than that. Okay. Cool. In fact, I think that's in one of the tables. Those are the parallaxes. Lineless. There we go. I, that's a lineless. I think the signal-to-noises are in the above table. There's like a million things in uh, table one. Yeah, it's a really long one. <laughs> yes. Uh, magnitudes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think observer... Observ uh, yeah, observation yeah, signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few hundred, good. Yep. So, uh, um, so all of our stars, I think our goal was uh, that they're brighter than a J magnitude of about eight, although we included yeah. some fainter ones if they're particularly interesting targets. Mm -hmm. uh, and we mostly selected stars we knew from the Bensby et al. 2014 catalog. Mm -hmm. um, that had about 700 stars with known atmospheric parameters. It was a great way to get um, stars and make sure our method of getting atmospheric parameters matched um, uh, optical mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also selected stars from the Apogee catalog for comparison and also to get some okay. red giants. Ah, yes, okay, so we'll get a little mixing up there. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so we have this big table filled with all of those um, photometric values um, to derive the atmospheric parameters. We go for a mix of using the spectra and then all of these large surveys. Okay. And so this is the big um, table of parallaxes and photometry from a bunch of different surveys that a lot of folks might be familiar with. And then table two is what we used from the spectra to get atmospheric parameters. Mm -hmm. And so this being um, a lot of iron one lines. And then we focused on that one phosphorus feature that we saw in Figure yes. one. Yes. Yeah. Center around 105. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, cool. so we only had so many iron one lines. And so typically you use iron ionization balance to get atmospheric parameters. Yes. Um, so, what we did instead of that, since we didn't have 
enough lines. So we took that photometry, we used Minesweeper, which was developed by Phil Gargano, one of the co-authors of this paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that can do uh, photo uh, or spectrophotometric fitting. Uh, so it'll simultaneously compare it to stellar evolution tracks and also try to fit the spectra. Uh, uh, we ended up using mostly the spectra or the, uh, the stellar evolution tracks. And mm -hmm. so we would use that to get um, effective temperature and log G, which you get from the spectral energy distribution. And then amazing parallaxes from Gaia really helped nail down yeah. um, your surface gravity. Okay. We then measure the iron abundances from those lines uh, in table two. And then we uh, um, repeat the um, photometric fitting. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, we're using both the spectra and all of these great photometric and parallax values. Yep. And we get out a consistent set of atmospheric parameters. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think we compare them in the next. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, the iron one lines were um, measured using MOOC. So mm -hmm. that is a local thermodynamic equilibrium code. It's a radiative transfer code. So we could combine MOOC with a model of the star's atmosphere with that line list from above, and it'll spit out uh, abundances based off of line strengths or the equivalent wave values. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and here we go on some of them. Yeah, so here's uh, a result with all the giant 163 star table mm -hmm. um, located uh, within the, the online data. Um, but we're able to measure pretty good precision, you know, between 50 to 100 Kelvin uncertainties, the, uh, um, the effective temperature, um, drive all of these parameters, the microturbulence, we don't put the air within this, but that is about 0.25 kilometers per second. Okay. Um, and then we have our phosphorus abundances, um, which we took good care in measuring. We uh, didn't use equivalent WISP. We actually no. matched it to grids of synthetic spectra generated with Moog. Nice. Um, huh? And then you have the uncertainty there that is a combination of the on the atmospheric parameters. And also we did a Monte Carlo exercise to get it from the fits based off of the signal to noise. Ah, okay. Good, good. Um, so we want to be very careful. Phosphorus is a big part of the paper. So make sure we got it right. Absolutely. Very good. Yes. So a lot of the uncertainties are between 0.05 to uh, 0.1 dex. That's good. Phosphorus abundance. That's good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I believe the next figure um, shows, visualizes that atmospheric parameter comparison. Okay. Uh, yes, so we <laughs> compared it then to Bensby et al, Apogee et al, um, a reanalysis of the Copenhagen catalog, and then the Pastel catalog, which is a compilation of literature parameters. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this spectrophotometric fitting, we're using these lines from the Y band that not everybody um, uses all that much. And, um, and so we wanted to make sure it was consistent with what we've done in the literature. And um, it generally is. There's a couple offsets with Apogee, but we find um, yeah. good agreement with the effective temperature um, for most of our dwarf stars and then the, the giant stars that are in Bensby et al. Um, I think about 200K or so on the, on the spread. Yeah, I think there's a table below when we get to it that quantifies it. I think the yeah. one standard deviation is about... Um, 100 Kelvin? Yeah, yeah, okay. Two, um, which is good. So if there are uncertainties yeah. about 70K and our uncertainties about 70K, if you add it in quadrature, that's coming out to about what we would expect to see um, cool. for this analysis. So this was really reassuring that our methodology to get the atmospheric parameters um, was working and good and giving both accurate and precise values. Cool. Um, we do draw cyan boxes around some of the stars with bad two mass photometry. So we grabbed all the bright stars we could. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of them um, uh, saturated in one or two of the two mass photometric yeah. bands. Okay. Uh, and we generally find them offset, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. they're not generally uh, multiple sigma away from the, the bulk of the distribution. Right. Right. So, so if you're doing this technique in the future, it's good to have precise photometry, but it isn't the end of the world as long as you can get other accurate photometric bands. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. Very nice. Yeah, and then there's an offset with apogee abundances, uh, but I believe this is consistent with other offsets. Mm, in with apogee? Push yeah, the, 
Yeah, they're generally in the order of 50 Kelvin, then I think log G is like 0.15 um, mm -hmm. dense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Apogee, log G, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was good to see, and then we wanted to compare how our iron abundance is matched with um, literature values, which I believe is the next plot. Uh, so parameters. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we can swim back to that. Let's take a look at figure three. So this is, yeah, this is your FEO bridge values. Yep. So we compare them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we got um, X axis is our iron abundance from this work. And then the Y axis is a comparison between our work and the literature values. Okay. Uh, and so we see with Ben's B, um, there's no real offset. I think it might actually be zero when you do the averaging um, or yeah. very close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, by eye, that looks right. Yep. Yep. And yeah. uh, we see the same thing for the um, Casa Grande 2011 paper, which was a reanalysis of the Copenhagen survey. Apogee is okay. There's a little bit of offset for the higher metallicity stars. Mm -hmm. But again, there's nothing that's 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 dex screaming that something is very wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Good. Is, uh, and then the other good thing is that there's no significant slope within the data. So we're not matching at solar metallicity stars and then failing at F over H of like minus one. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. And sure. so all of that was um, very reassuring and uh, uh, it is quantified in the table that I, I forgot the order and that we skipped over. Um, yeah. Figure four or table four, table five, let's see, atmospheric comparisons, uh, phosphorus abundance, maybe it was three. Let's go three. Uh, so three yeah. was all the parameters, and then four, yeah. I think, was the comparison. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so uh, oh, here we go. Deltas on, on FE over H and TFX. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can see for a lot of these, there's a, a bit of an offset that gets better when you exclude those stars with um, a couple saturated um, two mass photometric bins. Right. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. a little better. Yep, cool. So yeah, it gets better, but uh, I, I, we were happy with um, uh, those offsets, uh, mm -hmm. uh, demonstrating that our atmospheric parameter methodology was doing good, was doing good a good job. job. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, I guess the bottom left plot there is our first plot. Of P. Yep. Of P, yes. Uh, phosphorus. So yeah, what we did to derive this, as I mentioned, was fit um, all the stars with synthetic spectra. Uh, we determined the atmosphere parameters, as we showed above, and then we got the phosphorus abundances. And the first sort of check we want to do is to make sure that the giants are have or has uh, the same phosphorus abundance ratio as the dwarf stars. Um, uh, over effective temperature range. If mm -hmm. you have a collection of thin disk dwarf stars that are offset from the giants, um, that usually means you've messed up your abundance analogy, not that something crazy is happening in the disk of the Milky Way. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure there were no systematic um, effects happening with either effective temperature or surface gravity. And so in this case, we plotted up the differences with um, the effective temperature. And it's really nice. We don't see any um, significant slopes, right. uh, no significant offsets between the giant stars in our sample, which are in red, chosen from Apogee, mm -hmm. and um, mostly dwarf stars that are the, the black stars um, within that plot, chosen from Ben's B 2014. Mm -hmm. And so this is telling us that there's not, say, a molecular line that starts forming in the cool stars, and we don't know it, and it starts increasing the line strength or there's some sort of non-local thermodynamical effect that's happening and we're not aware of. Um, or that you're digging material up from deeper down in the stars and putting it up in the atmospheres of the giants. Right? Yeah. So you're not, you're not, not polluting it in that manner. It's still pristine, so to speak. Yes, there's no uh, interest. It would be very interesting. We could, no mixing effect uh, dredging up new things to the surface that are affecting phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Nice. So that increases the sample size. Yay. So, um, so yeah, that was good. And then uh, another sanity check is in figure five in which we compare our abundances with other stars um, examined okay. in the literature. Mm -hmm. 
And so in black, we have comparisons to Apogee DR16. And then we had a couple stars purposely overlap with some of the previous surveys, but we didn't want to remeasure what has already been done in general. Sure. OK, cool. And Yep, so we see for the comparisons to um, Mossadol 2017, so one of my previous works, 2019, and then Cathodol 2011, that um, mm -hmm. they're consistent within about 0.1 dex, mm -hmm. which given the uncertainties being 0.05 to 0.1 dex, is a good sign that we're doing the right thing. It's it's five stars, we can't sweepingly say that um, this line is perfect, but again, it's a good sign that things are, are doing what we think they will, uh, measuring phosphorus abundances from this line. Nice, okay. And then we compare it to Apogee. So we know Apogee is fairly uncertain. So we see a large scatter, uh, but it only looks like it gets really offset when you go to very low metallicities. Yeah. So up there. Mm -hmm. one star is way off there. There might be something happening around solar metallicity where there's a lot of scatter, but um, but we'll need a lot more stars to really understand how well um, Apogee is doing. But it was a good first step. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good. OK. So, um, so yeah, that uh, is all of our like abundance analysis are um, ensuring that we have good atmospheric parameters, ensuring that there's no crazy systematic effects with effective temperature. Um, we also measure the solar phosphorus abundance mm. um, from a twilight spectra. Uh, and that comes out to be very similar to previous uh, okay. solar abundance measurements from other studies. So once we're confident that our abundances aren't um, systematically off or at very large uh, uncertainties, um, we move on to my favorite part of the paper, the the, the results. Okay. And so we see 4.1 there is comparing um, thin disk to thick disk stars. Yes. So we wanted to compare um, essentially these older stars that have undergone a different uh, chemical history with the younger thin disk stars. Right. Yep. Right. And so to do this, we have to know which of our stars are in the thin disk, the thick disk of the Milky Way, or in the halo. And so we use uh, um, some various packages along with uh, Python packages along with uh, mm -hmm. Gaia parallaxes, proper motions, and radio velocity measurements to calculate their galactic, uh, galactocentric motion. So their UVW right. velocities. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from there, uh, we can assign probabilities on whether or not they are uh, in the thin disk, the oh. thick disk, or the halo, which is shown in that um, table above, and then the plot you're uh, nice. uh, hovering over. Yep. So we have the UVWs, which have good uncertainties because they're so they're very nearby stars, um, and then we have probabilities in what component of the galaxy they're in. Okay. Okay, uh -huh. good. And so that's, and then figure six goes along with that table. So let's blow that up a bit. <clears throat> okay. All right, I'll blow it up if we zoom in. Okay. Yeah, so um, so the top panel is the tomb ray diagram in mm -hmm. which we have the u squared plus w squared velocity component um, to the half. And then on the x-axis, we have um, the v velocity, which is corrected for the, um, uh, solar motion. And so uh, we then color code it where the stars that are black are the thick disk and those that are more golden are the thin disk stars. Okay. And just have some uh -huh. constant velocity contours uh, as dashed lines. Okay. And so there are error bars on all of those stars. You can only see it for a couple of them, but they're like generally right here, right yeah. here, here, yeah. But so otherwise, they're smaller than the symbol. Yeah. It's good. They, it's good. I, I love Gaia. Um, <laughs> and so we have a uh, <laughs> oh, devil. Yeah. So um, so we have a lot of thin disk members, some thick disk, and then we drew a red box around those that are likely halo stars. Okay. So we're more focused on getting thin and thick disk stars, but we did manage to nab uh, a couple of halo stars, which is very mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so we take uh, the same population probabilities and then we plot them up uh, in the bottom panel. Okay. Um, now comparing the iron abundance on the x-axis to the phosphorus abundance on the y. Very nice, okay. We have dashed lines for the solar values. Mm -hmm. um, and 
uh, you can see how for the first time with all of our phosphorus abundances laid out that phosphorus and other stars are uh, match the solar value, but it does have this strong um, slope in which your phosphorus to iron ratio is pretty significantly decreasing as your iron abundance ratio uh, is increasing. Mm -hmm. And so to me, who thinks a lot in chemical evolution and um, galactic archaeology, this is instantly sort of reminiscent of the alpha elements. Yes. So you see this like with oxygen, you make a lot of oxygen right away. It's not really made in your delayed sources, your type 1a supernova. And so this will come up in some of the other um, plots. Yes. And of course, just to reiterate, P is not an alpha chain. <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, so uh, we think phosphorus is made, I think, by neutron capture and collapse supernovae. Uh, but yeah, not, not the alpha, uh, okay. not one of the alpha elements. Right. Very interesting. Uh, Very cool. So I made this plot initially and I sort of squinted and I'm thinking it's an alpha element and you might be able to see there's a slight difference between the, the phosphorus abundances in the thick disk and the phosphorus abundances in the thin disk there. Okay. Um, mm, I can't, yeah. I can't put in the paper that if I squint, it sort of looks like this. So in the next plot. Um, not in an APJ paper, AJ not, paper. Anyway. Not in an AJ paper. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so in the next plot, I, I'm a little bit more statistically rigorous. Oh, okay. So, oh, there we go. All right, let's blow that one up. That's a pretty one. Okay. okay. So, uh, so we did a couple of things. First off, we removed the stars in which we are uncertain on whether or not they're in the thin or thick disks. So that okay. could muddle up any statistics. And then we removed stars with um, very uncertain iron abundances. Okay. Uh, if you have big errors on your uh, um, x-axis quantity within the plot, it'll artificially flatten out the slope. Um, so we took those with precise abundance measurements uh, that we definitely knew whether or not it was in the thin or thick disk. Okay. Um, and added in stars in the literature that were consistent with this. And then we assume that the slope could be fit with a linear line, which is an assumption, but it's a good first step. Sure. Um, okay, and that's the red, mm -hmm. the dark. Yep. And then the bands are like a, what, one sigma, two sigma, two sigma. Two sigma. Okay, interesting. Yep, so we did an MCMC fit so that we could plot up also the uh, a thousand of the fits. And so those are the very faint uh, red and black lines. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we'll notice we, there's a dearth of measurements at the lower metallicities. And so you can't really tell uh, what's yeah. happening there. Uh, but where we have a, a lot of uh, abundance measurements, you can see a difference sort of at the two sigma level um, between the fits on the um, thin disk stars and the thick disk stars. This does not hold at the three sigma level for the linear fit, so we need more right. stars. Yeah, um, always. Always, always need more data. <laughs> um, always, we need more. Uh, but it's sort of confirming what I kind of saw by eye initially, that it does yeah. look like there's a difference between the thin and the thick disk. Yeah. And so this is interesting because if phosphorus is sort of looking like it has similar behavior of an alpha element and that it's being made in these massive exploding stars, the core collapse supernova, that you'd, ex um, that you would expect it would be made significantly type 1a supernova and it would track sort of um, with things like magnesium and oxygen. So again, it's sort of behaving like these alpha elements, which I think mm. is, uh, which is uh, interesting. Very novel, yes, good. And, and so after looking at uh, the kinematic differences, the next thing we wanted to do is actually compare it to theory and, um, See how it compares the chemical evolution models with phosphorus. Scary. Um, so I think that's the next figure. Uh, yes, figure eight. Yeah, oh yeah, we got lots of stuff going on on this one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. There we go. Let's see what we got. Yep, so same sort of X and Y axis that we've had before, where it's iron abundance on the X axis, phosphorus on the Y, or the, yep. the dashed lines represent solar. Um, now all the blue stars are from this work, and then the gray points are uh, from various different literature sources that have also measured phosphorus. Sort of those like 190 stars I was talking about in the in the introduction. Right, right. 
So there's order of uh, 350 stars here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, one good thing is that our results generally agree with the literature, um, chemical evolution, which is always a good sign. And then uh, we plotted out multiple different chemical evolution models. And so those are purple, um, red, and um, the golden orangish lines. Okay. And so uh, the best fitting one is the red dashed model from um, Cisco et al. 2012. Mm -hmm. And so that was particularly interesting because they took yields from other works uh, like Kobayashi et al. 06. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and they took these and found that they didn't fit. They resembled more the purple line. Princess et al. 2018 is sort of just theory. Okay. Uh, and they increased the yields arbitrarily by about a factor of three. Okay. Okay. And when you and when you did that, it fit the data really well. Okay. Um, and so we wanted to compare that model uh, to our data. So if you can just arbitrarily uh, enhance the yields, maybe that's telling something about the reaction cross section or another process you're missing. It's not necessarily metallicity dependent. Um, so right. seeing how well it compares to the data is important for seeing why, why what's motivating this increase in yields and that the theoretical models are underpredicting phosphorus. Um, so I have one question. I don't quite, what, is the, what does it mean to be a 50% model, a 10% model, and a 0% model on the Ritter um, models? So the Ritter et al. models are interesting. They looked at um, what happens in a massive star when you have one of the burning shells, like your carbon burning shell, ingest part of the oxygen burning shell. Sure. So instead of, uh, I remember doing like 100 level astronomy classes, you think of these massive stars as sort of like onion with each layer burning something else. Um, but that is a very simplified picture. So in this model, it was what happens when they start to interact. And oh, so, so, okay. So it's those two shells. It's the carbon and oxygen mixing shells and how much, so the percentage here is how much you let those shells do their thing. In, in this big particular case, I believe it's the uh, number of stars in the galaxy that's undergoing this mixing. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you have 10% of the stars? What happens if you have 0%? Got and it. so this paper found that a lot of the odd Z elements, so phosphorus, but also chlorine, which is another element near and dear to my heart, and uh, potassium, and uh, cool. I believe vanadium, um, all can be enhanced by this CETO shell um, ingestion. And so I plotted up a couple of these chemical evolution models that they've created to see how it compares to phosphorus. Okay. And the slope isn't quite right, although I think their chemical evolution models were more uh, like testing out what happens if you introduce this. Yes. Um, but it's really promising that they can um, increase phosphorus in such a way. So it's it's certainly something to keep in mind on to why phosphorus yeah. chemical evolution models, when you just have the normal core collapse supernova type 1a, et cetera, um, do not match the abundance ratios that we're measuring in stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I like it. Yeah. So this was um, fun to compare to models. Uh, and the one interesting thing we found is that compared to Sascari et al, we were sort of now missing at the lowest metallicity end. Uh, yeah. 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 There. This is a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, within this plot, you'll also notice a couple outlier stars. And um, I talk about three of them in the paper. And so there's, um, that one is from um, Cathode All 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't put the error bars, but that one has huge error bars. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, so three of the blue stars, yep, that's one of them um, at yeah. an iron abundance of about 0.3 and a phosphorus abundance of about 0.25. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the one with smaller error bars, we followed up on trying to figure out why this was so phosphorus enhanced. Uh, and we found that it was a bit of a variable star. Uh, and so it's likely that using photometry with the spectra is throwing off our atmospheric parameters. Mm -hmm. So there's no. some unaccounted for systematic. Mm -hmm. uh, we followed up a couple on we followed up on a couple of those within the paper, but the most interesting one is at an iron abundance of about minus one and a phosphorus abundance of about 0.1. Um, so it looks phosphorus deficient on the metal. Yeah, that one. This one right here. Yeah, so that one uh, measured the phosphorus abundance. It was about 0.3 to 0.5 dex lower than what we saw in other thick disk and halo stars. Uh -huh. And so we dug into what was going on. At first, we found it was a halo star, which was neat. Okay. 
we looked at some of its other abundances and they ended up being consistent with the Gaia sausage Enceladus structure. Yes. It's a dwarf galaxy, likely a dwarf galaxy that accreted onto the Milky Way about eight giga years ago. And then we looked at its kinematics and it's kinematically very similar. Okay. Okay. Um, to that accreted structure. Okay. Uh, and so everything is pointing to this being an accreted star, whereas all of our other stars look like they're from the halo or from the thick disk, mm -hmm. um, the Milky Way portion, the high alpha halo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so cool. it's really intriguing. It looks like possibly these accreted structures might be deficient in phosphorus. Um, yes. Compared to... Uh, uh, Milky Way stars, which makes sense, they're deficient in magnesium and other alpha elements. So, okay. Um, okay. Uh, but this could be really interesting. On the other hand, this is one star. Um, and so we love to get um, other accreted halo stars and figure out what's going on. But that was the one outlier star that I thought was particularly interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and so, and so we, Talk about the uh, individual stars here. Yep. And then, ooh, what have we here? And so then, you know, it phosphorus keeps looking like mm. an alpha element. We looked at chemical evolution models, but we wanted to take it to the the sort of data itself. Yes. We Bensby at all study these stars. Apogee study these stars. Um, what happens if we take their abundance ratios and we just compare them to phosphorus for multiple different elements? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so to me, it's interesting that you can see as you added more and more delayed contributions generally with some scatter um, to whatever element you're comparing phosphorus to. So uh, the more and more uh, there's a slope to the data where the phosphorus to X ratio is very high and then decreases with increasing metallicity. Okay. So, so a couple elements like oxygen and magnesium are made pretty much just in uh, massive core collapse supernovae. Certainly oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for those, you see fairly constant yeah. phosphorus to magnesium, phosphorus to oxygen ratios. Yeah. Um, when you start looking at- Indicating alpha. Mm -hmm. uh, silicon and calcium, where you have more of a type 1a, there might be a slow, but it's still fairly consistent mm -hmm. over the, the mm -hmm. metallicity range. And then when you start looking at things like chromium and nickel, which are- Rare. Uh, yeah, made in uh, significantly type 1a supernovae. Other contributions, yes. Uh, you start to see these significant decreasing slopes. So this okay. Okay. is consistent with making a bunch of phosphorus early on a core collapse supernova, your type 1a kick in, and then it starts making nickel, but not really phosphorus over time, or significantly less phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, okay. mm -hmm. You see similar things for the S process elements with yttrium and barium, although okay. a lot more scatter. Yes. Yes, so definitely. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So I like this figure. It's not necessarily doing anything wildly new, but it is um, sort of confirming what we've been seeing from the other plots. Yeah, and it gives you a global, more of a global picture relative to the other. So very good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last thing we did was look at molar phosphorus ratios. Ooh. Yeah, it's a... Uh, so as this, you know, being a stellar spectroscopist and doing stellar abundances, I think of everything in that bracket notation. And one of my close collaborators, Natalie Hinkle, wrote a paper in 2020 um, okay. looking at phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, some of these really critical elements for life, um, mm -hmm. recast as molar ratios, um, since that okay. is a more interdisciplinary way to uh, uh, think of these element ratios in stars. Um, and so a lot of her work is thinking about star to planet connection and so on and so forth. Okay. And while and while it's extremely complicated, I think, to go from phosphorus in a star to phosphorus in a planet, and then to even think about phosphorus in an ecosystem. Life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beyond me. I feel like the first step is still measuring phosphorus in stars and then thinking about it in this new way. Good. Okay. And so um, and so we recast our bracket notation phosphorus abundances, we removed the solar normalization, yep. and we compared it just as um, molar ratios. Yes. 
And so one thing that Hinkle et al. Uh, 2020 pointed out is that the sun is offset in phosphorus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can see that, uh, yeah, our error bars are large, no, but right, they're like not too bad. Yeah, that the sun's there. There we go. Um, so the sun seems offset from the other distribution of um, mm -hmm. nearby stars, where the open purple squares are from the Hypatia catalog, and then uh, the circles are from the study color-coded by iron abundance. Okay, um, with, yeah, got it, okay. Uh, so we help to reaffirm that the sun, some, the sun is odd and we don't know why. Um, we have a couple offset oddball stars where the nitrogen to carbon ratio is very high. Crazy. And yeah. I'm not yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> uh, Looks like two stars there. Yeah, it's, I, I made some cuts to try to get rid of, um, mm -hmm. Anything in which mixing might have dredged up more nitrogen to the surface. So we're looking at just dwarf stars, but it's possible there's something odd going on with the abundances there. Uh, but mostly we just see a large scatter in the observed molar ratios. Yeah, mm -hmm. particularly in N. A little tighter in P mm -hmm. relative to C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so funny to hear you say that because, of course, we always use the the, the sun is our, our benchmark standard, right? Mm -hmm. It's a zero point. It's a chosen zero point. Mm -hmm. And yet that zero point seems to be offset from many other things. <laughs> yes. It, we know it best, but it, it, it's, it's complicated. Extrapolating. It's typical. From, yeah. It's typical of its neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but it is interesting that a lot of these stars do have similar phosphorus the carbon ratios and it is a good thing um especially that it might be enhanced slightly in phosphorus phosphorus can be um i think more easily trapped in the cores of planets um and so if everything was very phosphorus deficient compared to the sun that could be a problem when thinking about just since phosphorus is important for life what that would mean um but everything having solar phosphorus uh or higher is uh is probably a good sign, although good. again, extrapolating all the way down is very complicated. Right. Um, but good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. And so we end up with uh, the summaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Zachary, thank you so much for walking us through this very lovely. AJ article. Nice. Yeah. So you touch on it a couple times uh, as we go through. And so let me ask it, you know, how where, where do we go from here? Let's say over the next couple of years, are there going to be additional programs uh, that will generate 1,063 um, stars with, with phosphorus? Uh, are there other wavelengths uh, that may be good? Maybe something in UV, uh, things along those lines. Are there improvements that could be done to either the atomic modeling of the lines or, or the stellar models um, and those along those lines? So, so just sort of where do we go from here? Uh, next steps on phosphorus. Yeah, so there's both trying to get as many stars as we can. And so this is uh, um, trying to gather, uh, at least the collaborations I have at UT, more and more stars with a habitable zone uh, planet finder spectrograph, since it's one of the few that can okay. um, uh, examine that wide band region and continue doing what we've already done. And so that's one way we can continue looking at thin, thick disks, sort of the chemical evolution of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is to continue following up on these sort of oddballs. And so like these accreted halo stars, getting a much larger sample of that, trying to understand okay. if these lower mass systems are okay. deficient in phosphorus. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting direction. For additional lines, um, some lines are available in the H band that look interesting that Apogee you try to use, but instruments like iGRIDs with a higher resolution might have better luck. Okay. And so that could be a really great tool to try to measure phosphorus abundances in fainter, more distant sources, especially as it's um, on some larger telescopes or has a lot of good archival data um, from iGRIDs coming out. Uh, and then I, I would love more UV phosphorus observations. So yeah. the UV can get those metal poor stars because the mm -hmm. lines are so strong, but mm -hmm. the UV lines are at um, uh, 2100 angstroms. Okay. So you need something like uh, Hubble. Right, you gotta go up. Yep. 
And so, uh, and so those are uh, some of the different directions, continuing using HPF to try to get a large survey, following up on those um, targeted, interesting uh, stellar populations, whether it's accreted stars or these enriched phosphorus stars. And then I, I would love to do phosphorus, say, in the bulge or in star clusters or in other interesting areas. Very nice. Cool. Well, this is going to be really exciting over the next couple of years as uh, you know, we tighten this up and we confirm some of these trends and some of these oddball artists be very good. So I'm really looking forward to this future article. So cool. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.